Hi everybody and welcome to today's Q&A with the experts. Today we're joined by arrhythmia specialist nurse Kev McGibbon who's kindly taken some time out of his shift to answer some questions about atrial fibrillation. So Kev, tell us about the common symptoms of AF. Common symptoms include palpitations, shortness of breath, can be at rest or on exertion, dizziness, less commonly faints or blackouts, sometimes chest discomfort. And what symptoms should somebody be concerned about? Is there a time that they should seek medical help? If you've been diagnosed with AF and already assessed for anticoagulation, you are usually at low risk. If you have coronary heart disease and you get AF with fast heart rates, you may need to seek emergency help. Unless you feel unwell, it is usually safe to wait out episodes of AF and they will often self-resolve. Some patients will have been given a plan for extra medication during flare-ups. Is there anything that can trigger AF or make symptoms worse? If you have AF that comes and goes, known as paroxysmal AF, any stress on the body, mental or physical, can trigger episodes. Some people find that they can identify triggers for their AF, like alcohol or certain foods, and can manage their AF by avoiding triggers. So is somebody with AF more at risk of developing other health conditions, or are there any particular health conditions that are closely linked with AF? AF can lead to blood clots and strokes if undiagnosed. This is the biggest problem with AF. Anticoagulation, commonly known as blood thinners, assessment is very important and if you are at risk and prescribed anticoagulation medication, this greatly reduces your risk of blood clots or strokes. Also, there is a major link to a condition called obstructive sleep apnea and you should be assessed for this at some stage, but it is not urgent. AF is often found secondary to other health conditions. So when a GP refers somebody to see a specialist nurse or consultant for AF, what tests are they likely to have done? They will have an ECG, sometimes longer taping with a 24-hour tape or longer. They may have a heart scan, often an ultrasound or echo scan. They usually have a full blood screen. They are often tested for obstructive sleep apnea or referred for testing. They usually have a physical examination and have their height, weight and blood pressure measured. Okay, so when somebody has a diagnosis of AF made, it's likely that they're going to be put onto some medications. So what are the common medications that somebody with AF might take and, and why do they take those medications? Anticoagulation with apixaban, also known as Eliquis, Dabigatran, also known as Pradaxa, Edoxaban, also known as Lixiana, Rivaroxaban, also known as Exralto, or Warfarin, are common to protect from blood clots and strokes. Pills to control the heart rate, like beta blockers, most commonly bisoprolol, or calcium channel blockers, most common is diltiazem, and sometimes glycosides, known as digoxin. Most have many other trade names also. If you get the symptoms, despite good heart rate control, we may use stronger pills to try and keep a normal rhythm, commonly sotolol, or flecainide, or amiodarone. And again, these may have different trade names. Okay, so you've mentioned the anticoagulation medication, but some people who've been diagnosed with AF who are still waiting to see a specialist nurse haven't yet been started on anticlotting medication. So why might that be? If you are age under 65 and do not have other health conditions that can increase the risk of clots, then anticoagulation may be wrong for you. If you have a high risk of bleeding, then that may need to be addressed before you are given anticoagulation. Occasionally, 
anticoagulation assessment is missed, but this is rare. And sometimes it can take a few months before somebody has an appointment. So is there anywhere that a patient can go for information or support in the meantime? There are Facebook support groups through the UHNM, University Hospital of North Midlands, called AF Support in Staffordshire and UHNM Cardiac Rehabilitation Team. There is the British Heart Foundation website or phone on 0300-330-3311 and the AF Association AFA website or phone number 01789-867502. You can also contact your GP or practice nurse. So it seems there are lots of places that a patient can go to find out information. And one of the commonly asked questions tends to be around driving. So are there any restrictions to driving if you have a diagnosis of AF? Does it affect somebody's licence or insurance? If you have had any altered consciousness or faints or blackouts or any symptoms that have affected your driving ability, you should not drive until advised safe to do so. This is more strict if you are a passenger service vehicle, PSV or heavy goods vehicle, HGV driver, and the rules are subject to change. So check the DVLA website for current up-to-date guidelines. You can check this yourself or ask your healthcare professional to check for you. If you do not, you could be liable to heavy fines or prosecution. Always inform your insurance or they may deny claims. And how about flying? Are there any issues around travel and flying with AF? When your AF has been controlled, there are usually no restrictions. Some insurers will not cover you while under active follow-up and management. Almost all of them will increase your premiums. You can often get cheaper cover by shopping around and may find advice from others on the support groups. So it's worthwhile trying to shop around for a better deal and maybe have a look on the support groups to see what other patients have found and potentially have a look on websites like the British Heart Foundation to see if there's anybody that they recommend. OK, so if we come on to work then, for people who have physical jobs, are there any restrictions? Does heavy physical work make symptoms worse? There are very few restrictions when AF has been managed. Occasionally, people find that activity can trigger their AF, but most commonly it is the opposite. And the fitter you keep yourself, the less AF you are likely to have. And when you do have AF, your symptoms tend to be less severe. Great, so it seems then if people are able to keep themselves fitter that helps in controlling the AF. So would you say that somebody with AF should make changes to their lifestyle in order to help? We know from research that the healthier your lifestyle, the less likely you are to have AF or symptoms when you are having AF. Often you can do more for yourself and your own health by leading a healthy lifestyle. Don't smoke, moderate alcohol, control your weight, eat healthy foods and exercise regularly. This can help you more than we can do by giving you medication. That all sounds really useful. So on the opposite spectrum, are there any activities or hobbies that somebody with AF should avoid doing? If you have periods of AF that give you altered consciousness, you have to take sensible, sensible measures that could put you in danger, for example, a TV aerial fitter or tree surgeon, or someone with hobbies like rock climbing or open water swimming would be sensible to avoid. On the whole, there is very little that you would need to avoid. Brilliant. Well, we appreciate you taking your time out to answer these questions, Kev, and hopefully it'll go some way to answering some questions that patients might have when they've been diagnosed with AF. Thank you.